When it comes to building an energy efficient house, there are many programs to choose from. Energy Star, Earthcraft, Lead. But there is another option, Passive House. Founded in Germany, Passive House is gaining traction in the US. Today, we catch up with Wayne Turret, a New York City architect who recently built himself a passive house on the tip of Long Island. We asked him what he learned from the process. So Wayne, tell me a little bit about your firm and what your focus is. So my firm is a, uh, is a design firm, a design studio in New York City with a branch office out here in Eastern Long Island. We are focused on design. Mm -hmm. uh, we do a variety of projects. Um, we have interior designers and architects. Uh, we do everything from multifamily buildings, to New York City townhouses, apartment renovations, homes outside of New York City. We do commercial space interiors. We do hospitality. We've done hotel interiors as well as restaurant interiors. So we run the gamut. Mm -hmm. so basically, we like the challenge of design yeah. with a capital D. So in, in your firm, do you concentrate on including some of these passive principles and high performance into your work across all disciplines? Yeah, so, you know, it's, you know, passive house is a concept that's fairly new um, in America. And uh, even, before pass even before I knew about passive house, 20, 30 years ago, I was trying to incorporate sustainable materials, materials that didn't outgas. Uh, I tried to create better envelopes, um, but the technology and materials have evolved over time so that that's all much easier to do now. And it isn't a big lift for me to ask a client if they want uh, energy efficiency in their homes. Having said that, energy efficiency in itself isn't a big seller for some of my clients. But what is a big seller and what where Passive House comes in is that you can have a much healthier environment within your home mm -hmm. because of all the filtration and um, the sealed envelope. And the way that I do Passive House is that I eliminate fossil fuels in terms of cooking and heating and things like that. So the air pollution you get from those fuels are no longer in these houses. Mm -hmm. Did you set out to use your house as a case study for passive? Yes, I did actually. But, you know, I'm the kind of person that, you know, I really feel much more comfortable experiencing something first before I, uh, you know, try to try to convince a client to use it. So, I mean, the opportunity came up that there was this piece of land in Greenport. I negotiated to buy it. It took me a few years to come up with money, et cetera, and design, and then I finally built it. But having the opportunity to build a new house from the ground up really allowed me to say, let's do it passive. How long did it take to design it and work in all the systems related to passive? Well, I don't think it's a good example of how long it took to design because I just fooled around with it for a year or two. I drew, drew all sorts of sketches. It was more of a doodle. Mm. I had no, I had no deadline. Uh, so I, it wouldn't be like I was doing it for a client. Okay. Because I, I couldn't possibly sustain a practice if I took that long. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, once I got going, then it was just normal in mm. terms of uh, doing it. And I will say, though, that I had a, con a passive house consultant, which really was, was really beneficial. And I would say anyone who's doing it for the first few times really should have a passive house consultant. Mm. Passive house, you know, tries to quantify lots of different things. And, and they actually have a very complicated formula that is sort of above my head. 
you need a computer and you need their program. And then in that program, you input all sorts of characteristics of the structure, even to the degree that the program can measure the amount of shade that the overhang creates. If you recess your window into the facade, mm -hmm. that recess, maybe three, four inches, creates a bit of a shadow at certain times of the day. Otherwise, if there's sun there, and it will calculate that heat gain from that little bit of overhang. Wow. It can, it can go very, very far, and therefore it's incredibly tedious, and you really have to know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And that's why I had a passive house consultant, uh, someone named Jordan Goldman, uh, who was very good and really, um, really helped me out a lot. So what are, what are some of the things you learned from the process in terms of how it affects the building and the energy performance of the building? So um, I don't know. You, you, you hear all sorts of anecdotal stories about Passive House that I haven't experienced. So I don't know. Maybe I didn't do it right. But, <laughs> but uh, you hear things like you could heat your house with a candle or the body heat of the people in the house will create heat enough to keep it warm. And that may be for some passive houses, maybe they're, you know, they're small, they have small windows, there's, it's, it's even more, more R value, more insulation than I have, which I have pretty much a lot. Um, but and I will say that if you use those methods to heat your house, most likely there's going to be a lot of swings of warm and cool temperatures throughout the day. But if you want to keep your house to be more like a normal house where you're comfortable all day long, then uh, you're going to want an air conditioning heating system like a heat pump. And you know the heat pump can go on and cool it when there's too much sun and it's warm outside and could heat it when there's not enough sun. Uh, but what I found is that the way uh, this is designed, the way I designed it has worked quite well. Mm -hmm. um, I find that in the winter time, uh, because of the overhang that I created, uh, it allows the sun to come in for a long time in the daytime to heat up the house. So I'm getting energy, I'm getting energy from the sun, I'm getting heat from the sun, and it's virtually free. Mm -hmm. And it, in fact, that's the passive part of Passive House, is orienting the house in the right direction and creating overhangs that allow the winter sun in and the summer sun out. Okay. So uh, given what you went through in doing this project and what you've learned, um, how can it be applied to mass housing in general in the US? Well, I mean, it's being applied now a lot. I mean, there's massive um, affordable housing projects in New York City uh, with hundreds of units. There is a, a high rise dormitory on Roosevelt Island in New York City that's a passive house. Um, and there's no limit to what you can build with passive house standards, you just have to design it right and you have to build it right. And you have to be on your game in building it. And the main thing is that you have to create an airtight envelope, mm -hmm. virtually airtight. And that's not easy. And you know, in order to make sure you're doing it right, if you're doing a multi-level building, you have to isolate floors and test them as you're building them so that you know that you've hit the mark. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. In Passive House, you have to have 0.6 air changes per hour at 50 pascals of pressure that you measure with a blower door. So that's your blower door test. Right. So most codes are three air changes per hour. This is 0.6. Mm, wow. Okay, so let's get back to the house that you built. Um, you said it's on Greenport, which is on Long Island. Can you give us the specs on the house? Sure, so the um, size is approximately 2,400 square feet. Okay. It's, it's two floors and a cellar. And the cellar counts as the, as the envelope that you calculate for 
passive house. Uh, I designed the house sort of what they call an upside down house. I designed it so that the living room areas and the living areas are upstairs and the bedrooms are downstairs. Okay. And I did that because we have, uh, we're sort of on the water. We, we have the land goes to the water and we have views to Shelter Island. And the higher you are, the better you have those views. Uh, and in the living room and dining room, there's a what would be called a cathedral ceiling. I exposed the uh, sheetrock. I ran the sheetrock parallel to the joists, the rafters that are holding up the roof. Um, on the second floor, I also have a family room and I have a full bathroom. And the family room can can double as a, another bedroom. Okay. And then downstairs, I have three bedrooms and two bathrooms. Okay. And the cellar is where I have most of my mechanical equipment. Right. Okay. So I've seen presentations of yours where you talk about five things that are important in passive house. Uh, before you give us a little tour of your project, um, can you tell us a little bit about those five things? We don't have to go into them too much, but perhaps when you're walking around the house, you can touch on them too. Yeah, sure. So um, the important thing about passive house is, like I said before, is the envelope, the sealed up envelope. Um, and that's not easy to do. You have to really pay attention. And a lot of times contractors aren't used to doing that. So, um, you know, so you have to pay attention and you have to school them. And there, there's a lot of um, people that help school them. Okay. Uh, and some contractors already know, but out here, there were very much uh, uh, not a lot of contractors that knew what I was talking about. Um, there's a company in uh, New York, in Brooklyn, actually, that is called 475 Performance. And they sell a lot of these specialized tapes and and um, and building wraps and things like that that work with Passive House. And they can come out and help the contractor understand how to wrap a window. You have to tape all the joints. In any case, in my case, I used something called zip sheathing on mm -hmm. the exterior. Oh yeah. And and you know, if you tape all the seams, it's virtually airtight. So, um, you know, I think that that was the easiest way for me to create an airtight barrier. Uh, the other thing that Passive House requires is that it's oriented in the right direction. Okay. So if I had all my glass and windows facing north, it doesn't work that well because I'm not gonna get any free heat from the sun. It's basically that concept is more or less um, a traditional building concept. You know, before we had air conditioning and heating, uh, a lot of heating, you know, traditional builders and architects would take advantage of the sun. So you can't always do that in, you know, developments that have their lots divided in certain ways, right. but you can try to do that as best you can. Um, the other thing that Passive House has that's required is, is a way of keeping in the heat in the glazing. And mm -hmm. so in the Northeast, we use triple glazed windows. Okay. And, and those windows have to have good, you know, infiltration qualities. Can um, you use dual pane and achieve the same result? Probably if you're in a, in a warmer climate, yes. Okay. But the further north you go and the, the colder you are, the harder it's gonna to be to do that. Because okay. in some ways uh, you have to then beef up your walls and my walls are already 12 inches thick. Wow. And so if, you, if I had double pane windows, the performance of that would be so much less than a triple pane then I'd, I'd have to just make my walls even thicker. Right. Hmm. Um, you know, when you think of the envelope in total. Um, let's see, what else is there? There's, you know, I'm sure uh, a lot of you builders know this and maybe homeowners do too, but 
you know, in traditional building, all the studs every 16 inches, the way that they had built before is that the studs and the sheathing, the exterior sheathing was directly connected to the exterior siding. And therefore, when it was cold, that cold conducted right through the studs to your sheetrock. Mm -hmm. And if you did a, uh, if you did an infrared camera on your house in the winter, every 16 inches, you'd see a blue line. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, that you might think, oh, that's not a lot. But when you start to add that blue line, which is an inch and a half times eight feet tall times your whole room, you know, of all the studs that are on the exterior, it starts to add up. Yeah. So to create a, a thermal block is important with passive house. Okay. So for your walls, I'm assuming you use two by six studs. And then I you, did. And I used two by six. Did you use the zip with the, the insulation attached? I didn't in this case, but okay. I am using it in another case now. Okay. Um, and um, yeah. So I'm trying so to what, think of this. Yeah, go ahead. So what accounts for your walls being 12 inches thick? All right. So the composition of those walls are such as this. Uh, starting from the outside, uh, I have predominantly, I have shiplap cedar siding. Mm -hmm. Then I have uh, one by four um, furring. Okay. That one by four furring is up against four inches of polyiso insulation. Oh, okay. That polyiso insulation is creating that thermal break. Right. Uh, but be careful in doing it this way since you have to now connect your furring to your studs, you need a fairly long screw. Yeah, you do. <laughs> and, and those screws aren't cheap. Oh, okay. All right. So, you know, maybe using the zip sheathing, which is called R sheathing, right. which has the poly ISO attached to it, is maybe a more economical yeah. way to do it. <laughs> okay. Um, but in any case, so I then had my four inches of poly ISO and then after that, I had my zip sheathing. Then after that, I had two by six studs. Then in, the, in between the studs and the cavities, I had uh, unfaced fiberglass insulation. Mm, so okay. that if there's any moisture in the walls, eventually it can, it can dry itself out. Yeah. It would block it, except for the sheetrock, which allows moisture and water vapor to go out. See, I always assumed that you needed to use foam to achieve passive, but in your case, you used fiberglass and you did. Well, yeah, I used poly ISO and fiberglass. Mm -hmm. Sure, okay. the, the closed cell foam, everybody uses that now to create the air barrier. Mm -hmm. It's because it's easy and it's easy to get in there and spray. And then you could spray another couple inches uh, and it creates a good air barrier. The problem I've heard about with using that method is that over time, that closed cell foam may shrink. Mm. And as it shrinks, it creates less of an air barrier and more of an air conduit. Okay. So, so your house over time may become less and less efficient. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's, we can, I guess we can take a break here and have you set up so we can just kind of get a, a quick tour of your project so we can see exactly what it looks okay. like and see what the spaces feel like. Okay, that's great. Okay, so we're coming in. This is the shiplap cedar siding and I'm coming into the house and I am in the front door. Closets here, a little uh, break front there. Mm stairs here big tall stairwell okay with skylight mm -hmm. there's a, a large skylight above a very tall mm -hmm. stairwell okay entry stairwell uh and these are naguchi lamps mm -hmm. and this is what i call my upside down stair right the hallway to the bedrooms okay and um this is what I, what I love about hardware is that this is a self-closing pocket door. 
So is all your trim in gray? Is that what I'm seeing? Yeah, all the trim is gray and it's made with MDF. Okay. It's just simple MDF painted. Yeah. This is um, the bathroom for the two bedrooms. Okay. And, and those are the triple glazed windows we just saw there. Triple glazed. Yeah. And bathroom. Okay. This is just simple ceramic mosaic tile, mm -hmm. uh, American Olean and doll tile. Yeah. This is laundry, washer, dryer. And because it's a passive house, this is a heat pump dryer. Oh, nice. Okay. So it's, it's very efficient. doesn't require any uh, venting. Mm -hmm. And then, um, as I said, there's a little work going on in the master, but I just want to show you the, the door to the master is a full height, full width panel. Mm, okay. So I'm going to push on it. I'm going to open it. Uh, okay. And this is the master. Okay. And in here, the work is going on in the bathroom, but yeah. this is a sliding panel that opens up to the bathtub okay. and the bathroom. And I particularly like this pocket door. There's a double pocket door, mm. self-closing. Self so are the pocket doors also made from MDF? No, the, the doors themselves are just, you know, solid core doors. Okay. Um, but these particular handles I had made because I don't, I don't typically like, um, you know, the typical pocket door hardware where you have to use your fingernail to pull out the, the little thing to pull it out of the pocket. So, right. you know, I, I made this, so it's just super easy, mm. nothing mechanical about it. Okay. And now I'll take you upstairs. And so the staircase is also with the Southern yellow pine. Is that heart pine? Heart pine, yeah. yeah. Okay. And you know, what I think might be interesting is uh, to show you how the tilt and turn windows work. So this is one and you turn it this way and it opens like a door. Mm -hmm. And if you, keep turning it, it pulls in at the top. Mm, for venting, and, okay. And so when it rains, I don't have to worry about the windows are open. Yeah. And, you know, before I go upstairs, do you think we should go downstairs to the uh, mechanical equipment so you could see what an ERV looks like? Or sure, like yeah, that? we can do that. Okay. So, the, the way it works is that there's two systems here. You can see down here, the grill, mm -hmm. that's the air conditioning system. Okay. And it, when we go upstairs, oh, and over here, I'll show you. The ERV vents out all the bathrooms and the kitchen, and that's the vent for the exhaust oh, okay. with the ERV. And then in the bedrooms, there is fresh air supplied from the ERV. And then uh, if I need to boost the fan, so I'm taking a hot shower and I want to get the steam out, I press this button and the fan of the ERV goes much faster. Oh, okay. So... This is uh, what's called a Zender ERV. Oh, okay. Uh, it's from Switzerland. And the gray unit with the two angled pieces, those angles reveal the filters. One side is HEPA filter and the other side is, uh, is a, I think, MERV 13. And the HEPA filter basically filters the air going back into the house. But in this device, is where the energy gets exchanged from air going in and air going out. Mm. And then you can see this, the spaghetti of ducting. So all these ducts go to all these various places in the house. 
And, you know, sometimes in the master, for instance, some of these are in a device that holds three of these tubes because you need more pull, you need more exhaust. Mm -hmm. And some places need less, so you'd have one or two. Okay. Um, this is my heat pump. And I highly recommend putting in um, a filter like this mm. in, in your filter system with charcoal, because it really does eliminate a lot of odors. Okay. Okay. I think that's enough down here, right? Okay, sure. Let's Unless go see. you want to look at something more. No, no, let's go and see the, uh, the second floor. And what is the finish you said on that floor again? So it's a... It's a, it's a Danish stain, okay. sorry, it's a Danish oil uh, made by Woka, W-O-C-A. Mm -hmm. And it's an oil with a white pigment. Okay. And so here we are upstairs. I put this shelf in to, because we now all work here at home mm -hmm. in the last year. And then what I did is I aligned these windows. This one at the top of the stair with that one all the way down there. Mm, okay. I also use these kinds of hinges. Mm, oh yeah, concealed right? hinges, yeah. Concealed nice. hinges. And so this is the family room, my mm. office too. And um, trying to look here, if I could show you more ERV stuff. No, I'll show you more. Okay. Um, this is the third bedroom bathroom. Okay. So this one's a shower and I put a window in the shower. Mm -hmm. We don't really use the shower a lot unless they have a fourth bedroom being used. Okay. All right. And because of that, I also used wood on the floor in the bathroom. Mm. And with this oil, uh, water beads up. Okay. But it, mm. but it doesn't feel like you have any, anything on it. Yeah. It feels like natural wood. Right. And then we get to the kitchen. And so what I did is I opened up the roof so that this allowed me to have a nice, big, voluminous living area. Mm -hmm. If I added on the floor below, I would have a flat ceiling. Yeah. And the bedroom would be up here, but most likely most people put a flat ceiling there too. Right. So this takes advantage of that. Um, there's a pantry in here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. And there's appliances here. This is a kitchen from Italy uh, called Meccanica. It's from an Italian company and they don't make it anymore, but I just loved the way it looked. Mm -hmm. So. What did you use for your countertops? This really just plastic laminate and an exposed uh, plywood edge. Mm, okay. Um, the table I designed and made from uh, wood that was taken down from a spruce tree. Mm. And how, how big um, is your lot? The lot is just slightly under half uh, acre. Okay. Uh, but it's long and narrow. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see here that, um, you know, it goes back to the water. Mm, okay. A and, um, and I have a dock there too. So it's about 210 feet long by about 90 feet wide. Okay. And so what's really great about this is that the, the roof of the bedrooms below became our summer and winter living room and dining room. Mm. What advice can you give to builders who would like to pursue an avenue like this or even aspects, maybe not necessarily certified passive, but to actually start incorporating some things into their bills. So, you know, 
as I say it to a lot of people, I say that don't make the uh, perfect the enemy of the good. I'm not the first to come up with that expression, but in passive house, I think it makes sense because, you know, you can get lost in really trying to chase the passive house certification. And if you get that, it's really good. It's great. It needs a lot less energy. It's, you know, it's helping, it's helping the environment and all that. But you can do a lot to approach that, actually going that far. You know, there are energy audits you can do on an existing house. So a homeowner can make their house better by just changing windows, by using cellulose in the walls, um, more insulation. Uh, you know, it depends on how far they want to go. Yeah. As a builder, I think that, you know, builders should, you know, get more and more um, uh, educated about energy efficient building. And there are two places that I know of that can really be uh, very instrumental. One is Passive House and the Passive House Institute. And there's two of them. There's the Passive House Institute and there's the Passive House Institute US. Okay. There's a US version and a European version. And then another place where you could really learn a lot about building science is a organization called Building Science, mm -hmm. where they've really, they've really studied the way uh, water vapor migrates in walls, where the dew point hits, and, and all the stuff that's really important. The hard part is changing the way you know how to build. Yeah. And the hard part is change like that is always difficult because it's, it means that you, you have to stop a bit to learn, mm -hmm. stop a bit to think about it. Whereas, you know, in the last 20, 30 years, if you've been doing everything sort of by rote, then it's really hard to change, but it's worth doing. Yes. Yeah. Your clients will really appreciate it. Okay. Well, Wayne, it's been a pleasure talking to you and thank you for showing us around your house. Sure. Well, thank you. Thank you, All right. Rachel. Well, have a good day.